so I thought, well, okay. okay. All right, just to welcome um, John's Clark, who, as I'm sure you all know, is the lead artist on the Cathedral Project. And um, Florence is sitting here being very modest. <laughs> She's been working with John, and um, the output from her hand is around you. So I'm going to turn it over to John. <laughs> Um, I actually met Florence here, upstairs, Carol arranged it. I had um, seen an exhibition in the Mafaga Club, and there was some drawings of chickens, and I found out this was something called Florence Wanguri, who I didn't know. Um, I had been looking for artists over the last four or five years, and five years ago I started looking, and it was very difficult. It was, yeah, I, I thought it would be quite easy. I thought it would be quite easy. You go and speak to people and say, here, do you want to get involved in a, a project? This, this and this is the theme. <coughs> this is how you should, we can go about it. We, we, we need to solve these issues for, the, for this church, which have to be figurative. They have to be modern. We're going to develop a new technique for working these. And I thought people would be excited. But more or less, people said, no, you buy what I do. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't work. It didn't work. It wasn't working. And, and I made contact with quite a few people. And some people were interested, but not really for the part of the project I was looking for. And um, by the time I had seen Florence's work, we were then looking for someone to do what's called Stations of the Cross, uh, which is 14 pieces. And for this project, we decided we were going to do them in glass. Glass is going to be one of the main uh, artworks of the building. And so I'm a glass artist, basically. But it wasn't for me to come out and say, I'll make these. The, the, the concept of the project was to try to work and to find and teach uh, Kenyans to do this. For the whole project, for all of the arts, not, not, not just for, for the glass. <coughs> and so Florence would kind of fitted that bill perfectly. But I hadn't met her by then. I just had seen these drawings. Uh, there was a big one of the chicken drawings here the other day when I must be taken away now. But that was what I saw. I mean, it's got nothing to do at all with what we were going to move into. But what I saw in her work was a, a skill of draftsmanship and a pictorial depth that I thought, well, that is interesting. I haven't seen that here before. So let me see if we can get together. And so I called Carol. Carol has helped us from the very beginning. We met her very early in the project. And she pointed me at people, some of them who came into the project and helped and some of them came into the project for a while and put out again. So it was very interesting. So <clears throat> I'd seen the drawings and Carol arranged a meeting upstairs for a cup of coffee with Florence and we had a, a little chat about what I was asking the artist to do. And I said, I've got two portions of the project which might be interesting. One of them is the Stations of the Cross. This is a series of larger scale panels, that's a detail from one, that's a detail from one. You know, so <clears throat> you, you see a certain scale, the panels are two meters high and they vary between 45 centimeters to 60 centimeters. Now it doesn't sound like much, but a 60, <laughs> a 60 centimeter wide panel is a heavy piece of glass. It's one where we're about 20 or millimeters thick. Okay. Um, and so when I, I showed, that was one thing, and the other thing was to make a series of bronze panels for the main doors. And that was a given theme from the clients. This is based on, the, on two sets of what are called mysteries from the rosary, the cycle of the rosary. And so those were the two aspects. I said to Florence, what would you like to do? She said, I want to do all of it. <laughs> <laughs> and by that time, I really hadn't met anybody who really wanted to do anything. Right? <laughs> But I said, well, let's see where this takes us. Um, and what was very, very interesting, I get, get through this whole process, was this, the, the, the concept that we have in European art schools and professions is of design. So I said, well, I want you to design this. So well, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what does that mean in this sense? I said, well, that means you draw a small scale version of it. You take a scale drawing, and that's where you solve the problem. If we're going to use color, <coughs> the drawing, the color, and everything, the first idea happens on a small scale. You don't start with a two meter drawing. Or, that's not how I would do it. <coughs> and so, we had to, first of all, for both sets of the project, we had to go through this design phase. 
and what that meant and how flaunch it. And we should just use a little bits of paper. But I got the idea quickly. We, we make a scale, we make a scale drawing, and you basically try your design elements in that. And so that, was, that worked very well. And then we moved into the process of, right, let's now make um, some large scale drawings. And we quickly moved into trying to make a clay model. Um, both of these projects where everything was carved first in clay. Okay? I'll, I'll go back a little bit because why, why did we do this? Why did we go down this relief sculpted road? Which was very difficult and very new, actually, this relief sculpting glass into this, to this coloured level. Um, was that when I first started looking here, really the only company that existed was Kitten Gala Glass. And their facilities are very limited. And there's a very limited technical possibility there. And when I looked at that, and at that time, a friend of mine, a man called Tony Lugo, now has a studio uh, out in Canada. And he's doing what, what you would think of as traditional stained glass as well as other bits and pieces. But it wasn't really available here. And so I argued the case with the architects. What was available here was a, a sense of relief sculpted carving. I used to see a lot, even Kenyatta University and various places, I'd see this, these carvings. And, and I had just started working in relief carved glass. So you, you can't make a mold. Basically what we're doing is making a mold, like the things you see here. And making the mold is actually the most difficult part. Making the glass happens within a few days. Okay? Whereas normally, when I make windows, very complicated windows, you work on the glass for months. <laughs> but in this case, you're just really making the mold is the, the very clever part. And so it's how we got to, to that stage. And so we decided that was a good approach for Kenya, was to do relief sculpture. And um, Florence was chosen not because she was a great <laughs> sculptor in those days, it was that she was a great draftsman. Glass person, and she could draw, she could create and uh, make compositions. So this is a drawing, a scale drawing, similar to the ones at the back of the room there. And this is the level Florence took them to on paper. And as I, you know, the, the things change between paper and a, and a solid medium. And so this is, this is a clay, okay, this is a relief cut, sculpted clay, but even trying to find clay in Kenya was astonishingly difficult. You know, we originally just couldn't get our hands on any clay, you think, oh, I'll go buy a few kilos. Where? Where do you buy clay for artists? It's, it, it's not that it seems to exist. We finally got a supply of good quality clay that we bought hundreds of kilos from. And what's happening here is that in order to, to go through to the next stage, we have to cast the clay. The clay has to be kept wet and moist the whole time until we're ready to cast it. And this is a, 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 a substance called a vinyl mold. And we melt this to 180 degrees. It becomes liquid. It's like a, it's like a solid silicone rubber. And you can melt it in this big special pot, a big glue pot. And when it's at the right temperature, you can then pour it. And as long as the as long as the clay is still moist, you don't get it full of air bubbles. So it's, it's like steel. And this is like the following day we went into the studio and peeled them all off. So it's very flexible, but very strong. You can use them several. We've had we've had balls we made maybe five, six, seven, eight times uh, where things have we needed to take another detail from something. So these were all made down in the industrial area, all the, the, the clay were, were all the carvings were done in the industrial area. And then we took them all up to the, to the glass studio. What is a glass studio? At the moment it's in Tagoni, but we'll be moving at the end of the year. 
we don't know when yet. We? <laughs> <laughs> We've decided we're going to continue. We, we imported the, the kiln and, and everything we needed to set up a glass studio. We had a, a, a period of time where we were working with Kenyatta University and they, were, they have a room full of kilns that they don't use. Some of them big enough for us to work on. And we went through the whole process until they invited me to come as a visiting professor. And the following day after they invited me, we got a letter from the Vice Chancellor saying we're not doing it. I wasted a whole year, a whole year of our time. And so we then imported the kiln and we set up the studio. Florence doesn't just do clever artwork, right? <laughs> Florence is involved in the heavy stuff. The day to day, the, the making the molds, you know, Florence has to do all. And, we're, and she wants to. She wants to. She wants to learn, right? She's not learned enough that I don't actually have to be there. So that's the, that's the mold. The mold had a, an aluminium border put around it, a retaining wall. And this is a mixture of silica, <coughs> sand, and plaster mixed with water. And this, we get this a certain consistency, we've, we've calculated how much it should be, and then we just pour it in through a, 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 what we call a, a, what we call a, a sieve. A sieve, yeah, 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 yeah. Pour it through the sieve. So that dries within maybe an hour, that's dry enough to do another layer. What we're doing here, this is a coffee tray mesh, which I've never used before, I've never seen it before I came to Kenya, but we discovered that was a good reinforcement for the molds. And so that's uh, been applied there, and you know, we just developed technique as we need it. I found the best way of doing this was to cut it to size, lay it into the mold, put these bricks on it, so that we can glue it down with, with some of the same mixture with silica, sand, and plaster, we can then glue this down. And outside there's another batch being prepared. We do two layers, and, and that strengthens the, the, the mold. It means that when, when if you only put one layer on, a mold like that would just break. We tried it right at the beginning, it just broke. And so a layer of coffee tree mesh, even if the mold cracks, it doesn't matter, it holds together. And we've been developing the best technique for how to do this. Um, you've also got to go through a drying process. And with the help of the guy who actually made the bronze panels for us, he said the best way to do it is to set up a dehumidifying chamber where you bought you bought a dehumidifier and we actually now do everything on the table where we, we actually dry these molds horizontal on the table by dehumidifying them. See that material was again. Which material? That's that. This here? Yeah, it's the water. Well, there'll be some, of, <coughs> some of these are just plaster, but this is a mixture of plaster and Paris yeah. and silica sand. I get silica sand, I mean, it's unbelievably expensive and difficult to find here. You know? There used to be a place in Athia River who would mill it and prepare it into a flower, almost like plaster and Paris. They don't do it anymore. So either you have to import silica flower or we just develop what we could do and we found silica sand and plaster work okay but sometimes you get things like the silica the plaster would, doesn't work properly right the silica sand we have to sieve the plaster we have to sieve if we're going to make a what's called a ceramic grog to mix in to strengthen the, the base we have to make it ourselves we're going to get clay tiles from from kenya clay and we put them through a portion mill and then sieve that as well. It's an incredible process. What is happening here, this stuff is called frit. This is crushed glass that we're sieving onto one sheet of glass. To make these pieces here, we have to actually make glass six, uh, 18 millimeters, so three layers of six millimeter glass. And this is a, uh, the third sheet covered in this frit powder of crushed glass that we then melt together. There's two different tones here. And we went through a process of defining the tones that we were going to use as the base glass. And this is the, this is the kiln. So within two days, that has heated, fused together, and gives us these two different base colors. The idea of the stations of the cross, we like the idea of the tone increasing, the, the level of intensity increasing as we were running the building. 
So either Patrick and I are very weak because these things are very heavy, you know. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Patrick had hurt his back and I actually had to take him to a chiropractor because I, it was, you know, we're dealing with rolls at 80, 100 kilos. So then those rolls is preparing just any imperfections or sometimes you deep in uh, an area around the face or around the face or in the eye or something. <coughs> we also have to drill holes, which was very cool. We have to drill holes because underneath, we put these big sheets of glass on top and underneath the glass then air builds up and it's got to have somewhere to go or it's going to come through the glass at the end. So you, we, we started drilling holes in the glass then. And this is our next little section. This shows the frit being put in. The frit is just like sugar crystals. Different colours, <clears throat> and we found the best way to work these in the kiln. So the, the frit gets the, the colour gets put on in the kiln. Were you learning all that through trial and, and error? Through trial and error? Yeah. Yeah, no process, every single phase has been tried, trial and error at some point. So, you know, the, the technique here is different, different from the technique I would use in Germany. But, but basically what we're doing here is the same technique, it's just been a huge process of trying to make it work here. There's another fact that I come up with, right? so I'm, I'm in a discussion with the company who make this glass, it's actually an American glass, called Bullseye Glass. And I've been having an ongoing discussion with them when I realized that the, the glass is firing at a lower temperature here because of altitude. Now, melting the glass is one thing, <laughs> and a project like this, cooling the glass is the most important. Okay? Yeah. This, this is a so called annealing curve where we, we have to cool the glass in stages to get it stabilized. Okay. We had this horrible experience of getting beautiful pieces coming out in the kiln. Two days later, bang, I break through them. And um, I, I said, well, I think this is a factor. They say, no, 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 it's not. It's not a factor. But we're in two, we're at 2,000 meters, okay, compared to either 500 meters or sea level, the glass fires differently at 2,000 meters. So that, you saw that the glass being laid on top of that one, the flumps have been put Fit onto. What we have to do is put stoppers in, seal the thing, and we now have a fire which takes eight days. Now, eight days with Kenya power, right? <laughs> All right. So we have to we have to have a big generator. We've got a big generator, and that's been endless troubles. Around. This is fire to the other thing is such a filthy process. You cannot get a studio. It was a studio like it's like a, it's like the desert. <laughs> because you, you put molds in, you put molds out, you take the molds out of the kiln, they fall apart. <laughs> Completely break apart like a uh, <coughs> sand basically. And so you can have this really an ongoing struggle to try and make any order and, and sense of this. Can you reuse that expensive sand? No. no. Maybe use it for something, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Are you able to reuse it? No. no, it just falls apart. No. You can sometimes, but almost never, can you get a piece of glass off without damage. You've got small pieces you can take off, that you can find something else on. But uh, mostly they are, they fall apart. There are always undercuts in the molds, so, so the, the glass melts inside that, so when you lift it off, it takes part of the mold with it. So the glass melts into the mold? Yeah. And what happens to the mold at that temperature? It can maybe slightly crack, slightly change in shape, but it, it, because we've got the coffee tray mesh inside it, it can't really go anywhere. Right. So it tends just to stay there. And, um, we don't have any real problems with the molds. We, we do, you know, you have cracks, you just accept it, just becomes a little delicate line along the back of the mold. There's lots of cracks and things on that piece, and that was deliberate. 
But anyway, there, there's putting a piece up. The, the really frustrating thing about these 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 pieces is that you can take them out of the kiln, you can move them, you can rough them, you can move them around, and they're fine. You leave them sitting down for two days. If there's a tension in them, they break. And so that's why we got to this huge uh, eight day, eight and a half day firing cycle just to get these things to stabilize. So most of that is a cooling down period yeah, yeah. without any heat going on? The heat will come on and off because it's got to go through phases. There's actually one phase where I now hold the glass. And what, I, what I decided to do was to take the bullseye glass, the manufacturer's annealing curve and our altitude adjusted annealing curve and I do both of them. <laughs> so we've actually got and then we cover will be 18 hours at one temperature, so the kiln just kicks on. You know? So what temperature did you fire to initially? The initial fire is in the 790 here, which would be hotter in, in lower altitude. It would be about 830. So 790, then, and then it's just the annealing process yeah, of yeah. on, off, on, off, yeah. and gradual. Stages so down, down. We, we bring it down and then hold, yeah. and then bring it slowly down, and then another long, long, long hold. I think we've actually got a 36 hour temperature hold. So we know we at the moment we've actually run out of glass. We had more glass and brought more glass. Um, we ran out of glass eventually. Things were broken. We, we, we didn't want to glue anything together, so we went through a whole remaking process. And some of the molds we've made three times longer. So we're now going on to the external stations of the cross. Somewhere along the line we're supposed to make the 14 internal stations and then the bishop said can I get external ones as well. And so we, um, what we did, we're doing for that is a bit of this technique which is using clear glass. Although this is clear bullseye glass, um, we're using clear float glass and we're now melting pieces up to, tw we're making a base sheet of 26 millimeters, two, two layers of 10 millimeter and one layer of 6 millimeter, and we're melting all of that together first. So we've got a big slab of inch thick glass. And then we make a, a negative mold. So we use that yellow mold again, but instead of pouring a plaster into it, we pour a wax into it. And the wax sets, and then we make a mold around that and melt the wax out. And that means it's a hollow mold, which is how we did that. And um, so we end up with a positive relief sculpture. So we're making these in, in float glass, so they've got a sort of greenish tinge, and then we sandblast both sides, and they're then mounted outside in the gardens. And they're very interesting, because you, you, you always get something, but when the sun hits them at certain angles, then it creates shadows, and it creates, turns them into beautiful, kind of opal relief sculpted pieces. So we're working on that at the moment as well. I still don't know how you achieve that, that edge. Well, I saw that you're pouring, you're pouring on a very, very... That, 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 that piece there yeah. was... Um, you know, when Florence was, was making the, the, the clays and the moulds in the industrial area, I tended only to go to the industrial area on Sundays. And she had poured this mould, I think, on a Saturday for the whole piece. And on the Sunday I went in and we looked at the other moulds and the clay she had made this one from had split apart, had fractured like clay when you see it outside drying. And we both, I called her it and I said that looks great, why don't you cast that again? Just a piece, just a detail of, the, of that area there. And so we cast, she cast that and it was uneven. And so we made a mould from that. We, in this case, we made a wax mold and we, we, we did it this way around. So that's given us this very uneven, broken sort of sides. This was just a, this was a throwaway piece that we decided to, to make. <laughs> and it was quite a beautiful thing. I mean, it's just made with, with, with pieces of glass that hadn't quite worked. There's a bit of white separator in the back uh, that got pulled into the front. We just made this with scrap glass. And I just turned into such a beautiful thing. And we, we've kept the... That, uh, we've got a plaster cast of that piece that we can recast it later when we've got time. Can I'm you sorry, re maybe I'm sorry, but how the glass, I, I didn't see you pouring the glass. We don't that. pour glass. How? We melt glass. We melt sheets of glass. So that was, that was big pieces of broken glass that we had. Yeah. 
that was already 18 millimeters thick. Yeah. And we laid this on top of an, a, a hollow mold, a mold with the, the wax melted out, and melted the whole thing into that mold. So you have the machine to, to melt it glass? Well, that's what that kiln was. That's what, what, what everything was happening in the kiln. I, did, I saw it, but I didn't. You didn't register. Yeah. Oh, well, I think. But the, the, the kiln was the, the kiln was the key. The kiln was the key to everything that we did. What about the broken pieces, the sheets? Would you be able to put those back in the kiln and sort of basically you would slump and level so, out or not? We tried that. I mean, theoretically, glass will spread out to six yeah. millimeters, but I think it would only spread out to six millimeters when it was on something with no friction, which would, would be like molten tin or something. Mm -hmm. So we don't really get it to spread out. Mm -hmm. the, the thing I would like to do with some of these pieces is to make positive relief sculptures, a bit like this, that we actually make a wax mold mm -hmm. and we uh, melt the wax out and then we just cut a big piece of this, which is already t over 20 millimeters thick, and we just melt that on top of these. So, so there'll be a bit of mixture of color, but the actual thing will be a relief, positive mm -hmm. relief sculpted mm -hmm. piece that will then sandblast probably. Can you fuse that? I mean, you can refuse this stuff, you can refuse it, yeah, you can remelt it. Um, I mean, what we've used in these pieces, all of these pieces here, is this frit. You can see how it's, it's almost granulated. Okay, that's the, the frit is just melting. We just melt it to a certain extent. You, you see here where we put the frit on the base glass. And so that was the, a surface of glass with color on it. And then underneath, on the mold, there is glass powder being pushed in, or glass glass frit being pushed in. We started experimenting also by using the glass powders where we crush up the glass even further and that gives us a more detailed drawing. A whole set of very small pieces that we're going to make um, a, bit a bit like this but uh, for those the granules will be slightly too much and we want a smoother finish so we're going to use powdered glass to get that. Is, is anybody else doing any of this kind of work? This is quite, this is quite, really very new. You can always do relief sculpted glass. If you use glass all from the same batch, you can fuse it together. That's been around for a long time. But to be able to use colour the way we're using it here is all relatively new. There's this company, Bullseye. It, no, normally if you just took coloured glasses, like coloured mouth blowing glass, or the glasses that you normally would use in Germany, and you melted those together, they would just break apart. Once they cool, they just start to split and crack because they all have a different coefficient, a heat coefficient. These bullseye glasses are all made with the same, or virtually the same uh, heat coefficient. So when we melt them together, they stay melted. There's always a bit of tension, but they, they, they stay melted. And so that allows us to, to go into this, this layer of it. Um, you know, the very new stuff, okay? Yeah. And people kind of think, oh, this must be done all over the place. It's not. <laughs> Bullseye glass are fascinated with what we are doing. I did a project in, in, in Germany for Scotland uh, for the Glenmorangie Whiskey Company. And it was using this technique. This is when I first developed the technique of how you can run the colour together in a, a three-dimensional mould. And so that was really just before I got involved in this. And I'd started casting pieces and using this, this kind of technique. So it's all really kind of cutting edge, and there, there's not that much information. You know, you, you bullseye will say, okay, the, uh, the cooling, the annealing is not a factor, just do our annealing curve. Well, I did that, and it broke into five pieces. <laughs> so at least, at least with ours, it was only breaking into one, and now we're getting them to, to fire reasonably consistently that they don't break. But the other, the other issue, of course, is the, is the power going off. The generator mm -hmm. not kicking in sometimes. The, the, the first firings I did on this, this last trip, <coughs> we prepared two pieces. And it's a lot of work. You know, you make them, you, you cast the mold, you, you put in the, 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 the coffee tray mesh, you pour a second mold, you dry it, you prepare it, we drill it, we make the glass, we put the glass in. And then I got the guys up, I said, the generator's coming on. The generator's coming on for no reason. And they come up and they said, oh, the first time in two years, that's over, over voltage. The, the voltage from, the, from KP is going too high. Mm -hmm. I said, well, let's bracket that then. Let's bracket it so that it doesn't come on and use up all of the fuel in the generator <laughs> when I'm not here, uh, where there's plenty of the powers there. And so they did that, and we set it up and we had a firing running, 
and I've just fortunately went up on the Saturday when the kiln should have been at 550 degrees, it was 150 degrees, the generator's running. They haven't forgotten to put the circuit breaker in. So, <laughs> out of those two pieces, we got one. The other one broke apart. We got one of them. So that was, I think we had 12 days of firing and at least five days, six days of preparation. And it just, it's just gone. 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 Could I ask a totally commercial question? How do you get funding for, for something like this, and especially now that's a religious thing that isn't? Well, that, money. this, this is a, a one-off project. It's yeah. being funded independently. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, so, so everyone is funding it. It yeah. is being funded. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> yeah. uh, otherwise, you know, I couldn't be here. Yeah. Um, we couldn't have a kiln like that. We couldn't use this material. Right. You know. So, so that that's the glass pump. Florence, anything you want to say about the glass? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've covered it. But you know, the the the, 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 the process of, of creating the moulds is the, the the great creativity here, and that's what Florence has done. I mean, I didn't make these moulds. All I did with Florence was to help her understand what we were going to try and show, but we weren't going to try and show. Like in, in, in the bronzes, we, we showed a little scene. Right? This was a, almost a Romanesque idea where we show a whole scene happening within, a, within a one panel. For the Stations of the Cross, that would have been, you know, they're long and thin. <clears throat> the, the thinnest ones are 450 millimetres, 45 centimetres, the widest are 60. So we don't have a huge amount of width. What we've got is length. And so the, the, in those, we looked at the idea of let, let's just take almost a, a slice from a scene and make it relevant. So you're focusing in obviously on Christ, but Christ is in them all, and a portion of a cross, other figures pushed into the space. So it's, 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 it's a different problem to solve. And that got left to Florence. That was the first de design stage that she went through. And then you know, yeah, design is one thing. That's basically you've solved the problem. Then you go on to the full-scale drawing, things change. And then with time, you can see the difference between that drawing and the piece of glass. It's quite considerable. The, the ideas there, the concepts there, everything is there. But the quality of the drawing improved hugely, yeah. pushing it into the clay. John, can I ask one right from the very beginning? Were you... This was given the design of this cathedral at Carriccio from, from... I've been involved in the design team then, since the beginning. So many windows fill them, you design... No, I was more, more the other way around. Uh, <laughs> we were trying to... I, I've been involved with the design of the cathedral as well. It's unusual, unusual for an artist to be in that position, but I was on the design team from the beginning. I was actually chosen before the architects were. Right. Mm. Well, and so it's been very interesting and... We had a constant struggle with the architects because they're total minimalists and they didn't want any art. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> they could have said, well, we can have a crucifix. Right? <laughs> but again, so the crucifix is a great story as well. The crucifix, Carl put me in touch with Tombs, Tomb of the Yeshin, is that his name, Carl? Yes, 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 yes. <clears throat> he was a wonderful guy, wonderful guy. He's kind of hidden, he's kind of dropped off the, the map. And Carl said, Go and see them. I couldn't find them. <laughs> I couldn't find them. And then I eventually tracked them down. He was up beside Kizimiela. And I got him to come and show me what he'd been doing. And he showed me these things. And, and I saw some of his dribble sculptures where he was, again, working with the mold. It a, so it was a, in this case, it was a, a more of a complete sculpture than a relief sculpture. But he was working with molds. And what he was doing was melting lead or pewter into these molds and get this fantastic structured surface. And I thought that's a great way. We'll, we'll, we had to have this full-size figure for the, for the cathedral. And so we, we worked with tombs. Again, that was Carol's introduction. <laughs> so the glass, anyway, that's, that's the story of the glass. Um, concurrently with that, then Florence was asked to make a series of 10 thematic panels to be turned into bronze panels for the, the, the main doors. So the main doors are about four meters high and each of them is about a meter wide. And they're now made of, they're made of steel. At the beginning we weren't even sure when we started this if we were going to make them in bronze or if we were going to make these in relief sculpted glass as well. We hadn't been able to find somebody who could cast bronze here. So we had a real difficulty just, just doing that. When I first looked we couldn't find anybody. 
There was Matt Bronze, uh, is it called Matt Bronze? Dennis Matthews, is it? Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll make pieces, but only that size. I was like, okay, we need something a bit bigger. No, no, I don't want to do it. And so we, we, at that point, we said, okay, we're going to make relief sculpted glass pieces. And that would have been fine, but then suddenly there was the need for a porch on the cathedral, so there was a porch coming through, which would have done something to, to glass relief sculpture. It would have probably made them very uneven. Especially if they were going to be transparent, which these ones were. And someone said, can you have another look? And I just happened to be in the village market one day and there's a little gift shop on the first floor. And um, I'd, I'd seen some bronze pieces in the window. And I was, the owner happened to be there and I spoke to her. I said, I'm, I'm looking for something to make bronze. Did these get made in Kenya. So oh, no, no, they came from Western, uh, West Africa. and. But there's a guy I know who's just started a <laughs> bronze casting studio and he's over at Mushroom Hill Bridgeways and we went to see him that afternoon and he had just made a big 13 foot bronze sculpture for um, Kenyatta University and so I asked him would he be interested in doing this and so we, we all went through another huge learning process. <laughs> at the same time as we're trying to make glass go through this big process, how do we cast these bronzes? And for him, he'd done this, this big flat stuff and, you know, a little bit of detailing. And this is just all about the detailing. Yeah. But again, Florence was confronted with this as a series of designs and then as a series of sculptures. And um, she rose to that challenge as well. <laughs> Which has been fantastic. You know, you can't ask for any more than that. You know, it wasn't, it's not about me making things. It's about me enabling people to make things. And, and that's, that's what we've been doing all the way through. Um, I'm just curious, um, this is maybe slightly out of the way. Is there a rooster in any of the stations of the cross? Is there what? Does there a rooster? Uh, no, no, no. When Florence told me about this exhibition, um, you know, we knew we had, we had some bits and pieces, but when we were talking about this exhibition, and she wasn't quite sure, I mean, we, we were still in the middle of, of the thing. We thought we'd be finished a year ago. Right, we thought we'd finish longer than a year, but it's just taken so much time. But um, we had a chat about it, and I said, well, why don't you introduce the, the, two, the two worlds, what you were doing before, with what you've been doing, or what you are still doing, and this, this, find some way. I mean, the only theme, biblical theme I know with a rooster is the denial of, of, of Peter. And so I think Florence is thinking, she'll talk about these. But this is, this is the kind of reaction to where she is at the moment. Which, if I was Florence, I'd be totally confused and lost <laughs> as an artist, right? Because there is so much input, there is so much that we've learned, so much that we're doing, that to make an exhibition at this stage is between two worlds. And that's where I, that's where I see where we have it in the world. Florence, why don't you say something about your exhibition? Whatever you say, whatever you want, it's your show. <laughs> this project, um, yeah, thanks to Carol. Uh, yeah, that's when I met John, and he was talking about designing stations for a cathedral. I'm familiar with the Catholic, yeah, those things, uh, because I've been in Catholic when I was a kid, so I, I know, I, I had an idea. And at the same time, uh, what, something really nice that happened, I was looking for someone who could mentor me into relief sculpture. So actually, in that project, that's the first time I ever sculpted. I have never sculpted ever in my life, so I had to learn on my own how to do that. And it was a, it was a godsend opportunity. So before that, uh, he told me he wanted some drawings for the cathedral, so I was, and he was explaining it, but I was like, I wasn't getting quite what, what he was saying, talking about the design, because uh, as uh, the way I was before as an artist, I, I'm used to creating in my own free space, not a confined space, designing for a space, but you're doing your own thing. 
So that was that was a challenge, and I love challenges. That's the first reason why I liked the the whatever the project, and I told him so. So uh, all I knew was that I was going to do the drawings, and that's it. But when he mentioned about the relief sculpture, and I told him yes, I had never done it, but I didn't tell him that <laughs> because I was I was excited about the challenge and I wanted to know what I can do. I was curious to know what I what I can do, what I can come up with, and yeah, to see what what, what will happen. So that's how we started. Uh, he came to see me several times, telling me this this is right. No, you have to do this again. He's a very strict teacher, <laughs> <laughs> but really disciplined. That's what he does, and he believed in me. When I was, uh, thank you. He believed in me. Uh, so that's how we got them working. Uh, I wanted him to talk, to talk about the design process because that was uh, something new to me as an artist. I hadn't thought of the design process. So I think many artists don't design, and many designers are not artists. If you get what I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's hard to get an artist who can you can do the design thing and, and the artist doing the creative process at the same time. So I really love that challenge. Challenge drives me. Uh, yeah, so that's how we started on the, the drawings and we translated them into relief sculptures of clay. And we had, yeah, as he said, we had to get, we had to, we really go, <sighs> it was a hassle to get good clay, really good clay that you can sculpt with. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's how we went on. We made the reliefs. We had to make the, the, the challenge with the reliefs were, were like, let, let me explain because I, I, I'm not good with words, maybe I demonstrate. <laughs> maybe this is a relief. The challenge with those reliefs, the two meter long reliefs, and the rest of them, was that you, you can't, there was a, the, the depth, I had to work with a controlled depth. Otherwise, if it was too high, it, uh, the glass, it wouldn't have worked. Uh -huh. Yeah, it wouldn't have worked. So I had to control everything within a certain level. So there are several challenges along the way that I had to solve, which, was, which then again I loved. It's like you're given a, a mathematical problem and you go through all these channels in a maze to find solutions. So the whole project has been like that. Like every single process that you think is predictable, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's just not predictable. So yeah. So we did the uh, I did the the claims, the drawings. He was guiding me all throughout. Uh, yeah, up to yeah, what you see now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I I was curious when you told me about this project, and I came over to that uh, that, that that workshop that you are working, on and I saw so many drawings. You have done like hundreds of drawings, like strips of drawings, and I was I was surprised. I didn't, I didn't tell you, but it was quite a lot of drawings. Now, uh, one one question would be how. How was the limitation of space? Because, like you are saying, you are using a different panel from from a from a free panel where an artist decides what what size of, of panel to work on. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, how how yeah, the proportionality of the composition on those panels, and then how to to assign all the elements on those panels. The challenge of an artist, how you you, you dealt with that. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing, how did you uh, how did you come up with what to cast on, or what, how did you make the decision, or, or to conclude on which drawings to go to go ahead with and do the whole process of, uh, or, or, uh, in, in among those hundreds of, of drawings that you did. Uh, now, I was not working with him, <laughs> so that's why I was with him. So we kept improving everything. Uh, I'm given fourteen. Uh, long 
spaces, let me call them spaces because we design for space, we create art for a particular space. And this space is confined, I, I don't have, I have to fit everything into that space. Uh, yeah, that's, that's how it was. So, and uh, the whole project was based on a certain thing. It's not my own thing, it's already something already there, a spiritual message. It's a spiritual message that was, I was trying to put to, to put in that confined space in a way that it will relate to the people and to the purpose of that, the, the, the meaning of that, whatever. So, something I learned there, uh, I would say, when, when, I, when, when we were creating for, I'll say we because we are a team, we have many other things in work here. When you're creating for something uh, or designing for space, it has, you have to have a purpose. You, you just don't, especially if, you're, if, some, if it comes from somebody else, not from you. It has to be, it has to have meaning. So you have to play with elements and fit it into that space. So for the figures, for me it was a challenge because you're trying to fit in Christ there. You want uh, to show part of the maybe the soldiers, the cross, and you can't show the whole cross. And it is a narrow space, and the cross is like wide and have this space. So it was a, it was all about arranging the figures inside the space. And at the same time, you're arranging the figures. You want to to show the to connect the, for people to connect with it emotionally. And spiritually, so there's so many elements you're playing with in that small space. So that's why we kept changing. I would do a drawing, or maybe it doesn't look good, or maybe yeah, there's something that I, that is missing. So we go back to John, discuss about it, go back to the drawing, do another drawing, and then again, all the drawings have to be in harmony somehow. You have to tell; they have to tell a story as you look at each and every one of them. All the fourteen, they have to merge and get that connect with people because you're designing for people. Number one, you're creating for people. That's the most important thing. Did you do not it for just space for people? Did you do it in order of the sequence of events, or did yeah. you start with you, you know a main bit of work out to the scenes on either side of how it would have happened? <laughs> Um, did you start with the, with the beginning of the, of the crucifying, or did yeah. you, uh, you know, did, did you progress? Yeah, I did a research. Uh, I was, uh, of course, you have to look even for other what other artists have done before. Mm -hmm. For me, yeah. my artist, you are inspired by your own people. My like, fellow artists inspire me. That's what I would say. So. And this was a challenge because I had never seen such a thing. I think you can make it. And it was nothing. Nothing. So I, I had, it, it was a challenge. I had to think of a way of doing it. And then. Uh, it, it was, it's very, uh, it's not all artists who make good commissioned artists. You know, to be a commissioned artist, you have to have that kind of focus, you have to have that kind of mind where you, you take on a scene where I tend not to have anything I particularly want to work on because every project is different. So I take on a project and run with it. And Florence has that ability as well. A lot of artists don't or don't want to. It's, it's, that is a way, of, a way of, of, of being an artist, which is and it's an old thing. I mean, that's what Michelangelo and Leonardo were as well. They took on commissions. You know? It's only in relative recent times that artists had that total freedom just to create works and hopefully sell them. And so it's, it's a different, it's a different discipline you know, that, that I have and that Florence has developed in. And she's shown a great attitude for me. Yeah. To even go back to the scriptures you read, you have to connect with it. That, that's how I create art myself. If I have to really get the, the depth so that I start the creative process. So I had to think about this, how it is that it look like. I don't know, but... I hope it looks like Jesus. <laughs> but that's yeah, that's the process. And how do you think this work is going to affect you once it's all finished? Um, what will you take from this? What will you continue with? Will you continue with glass and relief sculpture, or before I 
started this project, I had so many interests that, that kept plugging my mind. I wanted to do this, I wanted to do this, I wanted to make out this. So I would say this was an opportunity to do something that uh, that was on my list. Fantastic. Yeah, so God's So what um, are you doing next? Hmm? What are you doing next after this? Uh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew uh, before the exhibition I was planning to do something uh, that involved relief sculpture and glass, but I didn't know. I had no idea what I would do. And when I booked an exhibition with Carol, I, 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 I didn't tell her anything so much, the details, because I had no idea, but I wanted to do something to show her what I've been doing, something small to show where I've come from, what's happening, the process of what's happening, not what has happened, but what's been happening. So that's why I did some relief sculptures, and uh, there, was something, uh, there was something I was studying on my own in my creative process, so that's what I translated into relief sculpture and yeah, I mean glass. So basically for me, uh, the glass was just a translation of, in this exhibition of my ideas. It was just a, a material that I used to portray my ideas and the relief sculpture. Otherwise I would have painted all, all these things in another way, but using the same thing. A question for John. Um, John, when all this is finished, is Kirito going to be in some way unique? Is this a unique yeah, technique? Or? Yeah, it's not whether the other people will use this technique, but we've found uh, at the moment uh, an original new way of, of working glass. Mm -hmm. And no, I haven't seen this done before. You know, the makers of bullseye glass have not seen this done before. You know, so we're, we've been experimenting with something, which is amazing to do in a country with almost no glass infrastructure to actually take on a completely new approach to making and having to source materials and solve things without you know, having to import tons and tons of material we're trying to use what we can get here. The glass is an exception, but if we're doing projects here, we'll just import glass anyway. But Caricho, the whole project, there's a whole series of unique things that have been made for that building for that process out of what was available to us. Another piece that we made is a 20 metre mosaic of the Garden of Eden, and that was made by a bunch of Kenyan Kukuyu Rastafarians um, using natural offcuts of stone, and uh, offcuts of natural stone that were cut into mosaic. Right? And so that's another thing that we've actually been able to create that I haven't done, see, seen done in Kenya before. You know? well, that's in Kuricho, isn't it? That's in Kuricho. We used the, our, the, the, the roof of the building as the most prominent feature, and there's a 60 meter roof all made with the cheapest Kenya clay tiles. And I developed a technique where we could beautify the roof just by making two asymmetrical cuts on these tiles and building a pattern with them. Again, it's something that's not been done before, and it's something that's available to artists in Kenya, and it's, a, it's an idea that's out there. So it's it the architects for the there are architects, the main architects are a company called John McCaslin, <coughs> a London-based architect. So the, the, the clients and the coordinators of the project tried to find a, a Kenyan um, architect company that would, could run with this, and it, it just didn't work. This, it goes back to the same issue, actually. It goes back to the design issue. Yeah. And that wasn't really working, but the company Triad took on the building of the project. If you don't try it, yeah. they've been really crucial to the whole to the whole thing. Do you don't have images of the, the panels? Well, they're not placed yet. Well, most of them are placed actually. Yeah. Um, there, there are, if you want, I can send you some, some more videos. But there's all sorts of stuff. <laughs> all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And when will it be ready? Please? Well, it is ready. I mean, it's been dedicated last year. We were just just trying to get the rest of the artworks into the building. There the, are the, so many processes. The, the bronze doors took twice as long as we, we thought. You know, the, again, the, the man who was making them was at the edge of his capabilities. So he's learned a huge amount in this process as well, as we all have. Yeah. Very informative. Yeah. And so, 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 yeah. A construction, what happened? I mean, the way forward for this, basically, is we're, is we're trying to 
I'm not giving enough attention. Is there something you'd like to say? Um, you know, the way forward is that we don't. We, the, the, the kiln and the facility is, is being. We're not going to take it back out of Kenya, so we're trying to set the mechanism where we can use it, where other artists can use it as well, where we have a facility. So Florence and I are going to set up a studio somewhere else. At the moment, we've borrowed a studio, but we're going to set up a glass studio and just start producing. That's, that's our next our next one. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, Uh, maybe you should you should you should talk about your transition as an artist. I know you don't like to explain a lot about what you do, but uh, see, as an artist, you have to explain what's happening in your life because two years two years ago, we used to draw uh, some nice chicken, you know you know, detailed charcoal drawing, detail of chicken and and then you moved on to this project and now I can see some chicken with some you know <laughs> images of of, uh, of of a man, of a muscular man. The figure drawing and uh, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a of a muscular man. How how do you find the connection? How do you, how is the journey from the chicken to what you're doing? Mm, um, it's not only before as I, when I was doing the chicken drawings, it's not only that uh, I drew chicken only, I drew many things. <laughs> <laughs> That's the past. Maybe the chicken is the thing maybe some people. Well, you know, yeah. yeah. But uh, I was interested also in the uh, figure drawing, but I hadn't quite really sat down and thought of doing it right on some of my mind. So again, this project was an opportunity. And something that happened, I realized that um, by the end, let's say, let's say by the beginning of this year, I looked at my drawings. I, I, started, I had started drawing some things. And I looked at the figure drawings that I was doing and the ones I did like two years ago. Something has changed, completely changed. These were more accurate more proportional. I don't know. I think I didn't think that it would happen because I was just dealing with glass or clay. But there's something that hap that happens to your mind. I, I can't explain it, but working with clay has really it has done something. So maybe it's looking at the more you look at the figures, the more something strange in your mind. The more you look at a face, the more the, every line, every contour registered on your mind. So something happened there. So I found myself into figure drawing. <laughs> I don't know how to find that, but that's how what happened. It was more accurate and better than before, and it was different. But I I like different. I like that. I like that challenge. So that's how it has been. But I've always wanted to do this. I don't think you answered his question. Okay, what did you? Uh -huh. um, you 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 sort of got around it. Maybe it's difficult for you to put into words. You actually put it into words for me, uh, and I think your video. The, I don't know if this is the same one, but the one that you had at the opening also clarified a lot. I think, don't you feel that it had to do a lot with this process that you've gone through? It's a phenomenal exercise that you have, you know, you embarked on with this church that had you going through many steps and processes and learning things that you hadn't known before and discovered about your capabilities? Uh, I would say the ideas were there. The, before the project I had, I had an idea of what I want to do, but as a, it, it's like a list of what you want to do in the future, but you haven't done it. And then an opportunity comes, and you get away of doing, taking care of that list. That's how the simplest way I can explain. 
<laughs> Sorry. I, I, I find them like particularly the reliefs you've done on this side of the wall. Your 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 drawings particularly have so much movement and light. And again, it feels it feels there's so much movement, like particularly that one with the with the change in the movement. These these have a sort of very very formal Contrast is a good word, but you know, it, it's, a, it's a very iconic imagery that you, you would see in churches. And I, I love what you're doing here with, you know, injecting yourself into it. Because even this piece with the hands behind the head um, and the movement there, so that it's, you're sort of breathing life into quite a static material. Yeah, uh, these were supposed to be probably what happened. By the time the exhibition day was here, there are some things that went wrong. So this was the they were supposed to be more pieces than this for the exhibition. But I had to bring this for show the creative process for support. Yeah. But these are more oh, 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 they are more formal and they are more controlled because you are working with a theme and you had to when you're working with a spiritual theme and, and it's in a church, you have yeah. to sit down with the bishop. You can't do anything above and beyond the picture of what you're doing and the theme and the purpose. I would have wanted to draw a certain thing. I would have changed things if it was my own piece. But as I say, as I was saying, it's, it's for the chat, it's for a certain purpose. And it's approved. No, which is nice see because I can yeah. understand you yeah. had a brief that's, that's follow it is. Um, and yeah. And yeah. but what I what I liked in these pieces is that the, there's you back in, I mean, this shows a lot of skill, mm -hmm. but also this shows, I guess, the liveliness of where, where you were coming from with the chicken drawings. I don't know any of the other drawings because I haven't seen them, but, um, but I have seen all your... <laughs> but yeah, uh, um, the reason I didn't do uh, drawings, uh, I've been working with a uh, relief sculptor and glass and I wanted to I wanted to, to delve into to put my my own ideas into that to translate my own ideas into the new sculpture and see what happens. So it was sort of an experiment also for me. And at the same time bring out the message that I was trying to portray to the new sculpture. Are there any plaster? This is plaster. Yeah, these are plaster. Mm -hmm. Your uh, creative process involves three very different media, starting with the drawing and then going to the clay and then yeah. going to the glass. Yeah. Do, you, do you start with a, a vision of where you're going to end up with the glass, or is each stage sort of a sort of a reworking of, a, of an idea? Um, <laughs> but uh, when, when, uh, when I have an idea, and uh, before I even draw it, it's already in my head, I see the drawing. I'm already seeing picture in the drawing, I'm already picturing the final product in relief. Yeah, and most of the cases, if it's not close, it's almost the same somehow. That's how I find it, always. And, and now between the idea, putting the idea on the paper and the final product, some things change. But not so much, yeah. Because the picture that's already was there, it's always, almost, most of the time it's always the final product. Even if I don't know how to do it. Do it. Yeah, I try to find a way of doing it. But the glass must um, give you an element of surprise when yeah. it finally comes out. It's a bit like um, pottery firing. You never know quite what the glaze is going to do in a reduction firing, for instance. And it's always the excitement of seeing that item out of the kiln. So for, I'm sure for you, with the glass, it must have been equally exciting, especially with the light coming through, again changing it from seeing the flat in the kiln to holding it up and seeing what your glass sprit did. Very much. Yeah. Actually, the first thing he, he gave me was Okay, I had done. A, I had worked on a relief, and uh, we made a cast of the relief. And he told me 
this is glass, this is what you really explain. He didn't really quite show me, but yeah, I think he wanted me to learn on my own. So I did something, <coughs> I tried it and it worked. That's how I, I learned. And uh, it was very interesting because I've never seen a relief that's flat. But at the same time, it's, it's a relief, just a 3D quality is illuminated. I've never, I've never even thought of such a thing, so for me it was very interesting. And the plaster and the yeah. glass is so, yeah. so different, obviously. Two uh, totally different things. The other thing you have to bear in mind is these are, these are made for specific locations, yeah. and you can even work in. Yeah. So you have to visualize it in that space, yes. you know, to see how it's going to work proportionally to the space, to take the drawings and look at them from a certain distance and how are you going to read. And it's the same with the glass and the building. You, you, the, you haven't solved the problem until the, the, the element was into the building it was made for, yeah. into the space it was made for. And that was also very interesting because just a few weeks ago we were up in Caricho installing, we had already put pieces in, but this was nine, um, 11 pieces went in on that, on that day. Yeah. And so we're really seeing right now working. Where did they read best? How did they read? Did read close up? You can read them close up as close as you want. And about halfway in the middle of the aisle of the church, they read differently. From the other side of the church, they read mm -hmm. differently. And then glass is so dependent on what the light is. And these panels, there's no painting in them. It's all the relief sculpture that's working. That's what makes that one so fascinating. It's just the relief sculpture. There are some areas which are in darkness. At the moment you change position, they're going to be in highlight. And they're so dependent on what is behind them. And you have to know that in advance. Different times of the day as different well. Different times of the day, different yeah, times of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It keeps sort of changing. And you move. You move past yeah. it, it changes. And are you excited by what you've created between you? Um, or are, are there some disappointments where you feel, I wish I'd done that, or I wish I'd, you know, could redo that one? Yeah, I, uh, there was a moment I felt, uh, I feel like I've done the in a certain way, but... I think uh, from the start to up to where I am now, I wouldn't have gotten to this point if I did have those learning moments, mm -hmm. the disappointments. So I don't think I will change anything as much. No. Maybe in another project. Yes. But for this, every single failure has been, it has worked out for good somehow. Mm -hmm. And we have learned a lot. It is tedious. Sometimes you don't even want to look at glass at the end of the day, but you, you try to, to think, why am I here, what, what am I doing, what, what are people expecting at the end, what's the purpose of this project, so that keeps me going, yeah, exactly. getting there and imagining how it would be. You have that picture of the final product of your thing. Even if it's not here, I, I can. I, I used to see all of them in line inside the church and I would say, yeah, I have to get to that point. Even if we, we, we have made, we spent weeks and weeks making things and then they break. I, I had that picture in my mind and I had to get there. So it's been a series of years and no you know, there was another there was another aspect of the stations which was very interesting. At one point we made the decision that the, the head of Christ and the cross should always be on the same plane within the building. Oh. Oh. So so that, that was a decision that they were there wasn't a figure in the distance, they were always on the same plane. And so they were always there and they were all roughly the same size. And that was a call we made, you know, to solve this this series. And what was, what was very interesting when we went through, if, as you, if you saw the film there, the first pieces, the, what we call the base glass, was going to be quite pale. And by the time we got to the end, we had found a, we found a mixture of, of fruits. When we mixed the bronze with the amber, it produced this speckled quality, which is quite astonishing. And we, we just found that. We said, right, we're going to darken these to a certain degree and then we'll just leave them. That's the level of darkness at the base. So there's a build-up of intensity. And the clients absolutely loved that. And, you know, they were saying, well, you've never seen anything. You've never seen a set of stations of the cross where the, the, the intensity builds up. You know. So I mean, it's, we just did so many different things over the course of this process. And the decisions that were made early on, we, we, we stuck with yeah, and there is still room for experiment. It's just that there is little time. I'm sure after the project is done, you can do a lot 
especially I want to concentrate on my on my actor also and produce something for me from the whole experience. That's what I'm planning. But this was just for me. something we need to show as we have. Now John, you say the intensity builds up, right? but that to be taken, where you walk into the church, the climax is going to be sort of where... Well, when you're, leaving, you're starting off from the, the, first, the first of the stations, it's, it's, it's quite pale, maybe like that figure there. And there's, a, there's a lot of background and robes and things as well, it's not just the heads. So, so this background it starts off fairly pale and starts to get a little bit deeper. And as you go around towards the crucifixion, and the descent from the cross and the, the tomb, and then they become darker and more somber. Uh, it's just that it's just you're building something up, and that was just an idea. Yeah, yeah. Where where we go? Yeah. <coughs> well, you, no, I just did you say how the the dimension, like the, the size? The, the, each of the panels is two meters high. Uh huh. And and, and the width varies between uh, forty-five to sixty centimeters. They've got two and a half centimeter increments. And they're, they're, they're positioned, the, 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 the cathedral is built with a series of arches. And when these arches come down, then the, the width of the arch is the width of the opening. And so the glass fits within. And that's why they change. It's a series of progressively larger arches building up in the cathedral to create this big space. We have to go there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everyone who likes art should go there. I think it's worth yeah, with the bronze panels and the glass and the outside sculptures, uh, it will be what well. I think it may be one day a national one. Yeah. 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 Did you say what more you need to do? Uh, Did you have you have you? I mean, you still have a bit more to complete, oh, yeah. right? What is it that you have to do remaining? Uh, we have uh, a replica of the internal station outside, which we are doing in uh, a positive relief. A positive re relief is like this one, where you're reading the sculpture, the relief outside. That's a negative relief. It's behind, so the surface is smooth. So it's a bit like this, but now with, uh, we had a way, we had to find a way of using the glass we find here not glass or the normal glass window, that's what you're going to use. So make uh, leaf sculptures with the normal glass, They're quite thick and heavy, and then sandblast them so that the relief reads really nicely, and then uh, place them outside. So like 14 of them, so we are still working on that. Yeah. The glass for those I was saying earlier is we're melting, we're melting two sheets of 10 millimeter glass and a sheet of 6 millimeter glass together to give us a block of glass to begin with. So it's over an inch thick, a big slab of glass, which is, weighs about 80 kilos uh, average. And they get put onto the mold and just slumped into the mold, melted into the mold. And so all, all of the work in all of these cases is, is the, is the, is the mold. The glass happens by itself. We're also working on, and Florence hasn't mentioned this, that the last challenge I threw at her was that I had this idea for making small panels for the little chapel. And within the concept of this project with the relief sculpting, <clears throat> I had experimented with using lino, making lino cuts and sort of printing from them, recasting them. And I, so I brought in some 4mm lino from Germany and we're using them as a relief sculpted medium. So she's been working on cutting liners as well. <laughs> You've enjoyed that too, haven't you? Yeah. Okay, it's a challenge. You're working with that. This thickness, and you have to read the whole, like, uh, translate the whole thing there in the relief. So it's quite a challenge, but good for you. <laughs> and that works with the glass, with the heat of the glass. Well, we're not, we're not, we're casting from it. We're casting from it oh, and yeah, then yeah, yeah. turning yeah. into it. Yeah, I forgot that. So I'm hoping uh, if the studio is set up, we can start standing on, on glass for Kenya. I would love, uh, I got an opportunity, I would love someone else to get an opportunity to work of people, of whoever who is interested in I think it's a beautiful media. Because, especially yeah. because of the 
illumination quality of glass mm -hmm. and the way it changes with the light. For me, that's, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to see more of that. Yeah, so just, just to finish then, but from what I've seen with Florence was just, <laughs> as, as just to, to be able to become a commissioned artist. Now, not all artists want to be that, but it has, for me, it's been a very interesting life. You know, I've worked all over the world now, and it's been a very interesting life. And if you're able to do it, and you like it, then it's a, it's a nice thing to be. You know, you, you, you can be successful as a painter and a sculptor as well, you can have worldwide recognition. I love the challenge as Florence does to take on a new concept, a new idea. Even I'm working on a project in Shanghai where they originally wanted windows like the original windows that had been in the church. Uh, they wanted those replaced and gradually we're kind of gone from that very first almost Victorian style working through something else. And so, and so these opportunities come in a medium like glass or, or whatever. And whether you can go with it or whether you say, okay, that's it, I want to stay in my little box. Um, but there's nothing wrong with it. It's just it's not the way I work. And what I see in France is a great potential to be able to do that, to rise to a challenge here in Kenya or anywhere else, uh, to say, right, let's make something based on what we've learned here, which is unique. So I, I'm, I think she's a star. She's my star. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.